First off the mark is Eva Setinich. She is a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Digital Visual Studies at the University of Zurich, and her research focuses on exploring deep learning techniques for computational image understanding and multimodal reasoning in the context of visual art. So, uh, the panel's title is basically chosen around her research, you could say, home game. And we're very excited for your lecture, Multimodal Models uh, as Cultural Snapshots. Okay, hi, hello everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to talk today about some of the things that were already discussed in the previous panel and yesterday. And uh, so I kind of considered this talk a continuation of the previous panel. Uh, I see a lot of overlaps in the questions that we're asking. And I think also that the fact that we're talking so much about these multimodal models, in particular text-to-image generators, just reflects this enormous, enormous attention that those models are currently gaining, and also indicates they're, that they're not just tools or just a new AI play to toy, but there is something to them, you know, that they're a phenomenon in themselves that can, in themselves that can be analyzed. So I would try to, in my talk today, kind of position them in a, in a broader context, but I would like to start with some fundamental and basic concepts, uh, the concept of multimodality, which we consider very <clears throat> natural and inherent in our way of communicating, processing, interpreting information. Um, however, in the context of, of deep learning and machine learning research, uh, the ability to really successfully process uh, information of different modalities is something very new. And uh, in the last 10 years, all this advancement that happened uh, were, so to say, monomodal, right? You have text, you have images, sound, whatever, and you have different types of neural networks that process texts and images and so on, right? Um, of course, the underlying principle is the same, and that is that all these deep neural network models transform data inputs into a numerical representation, which is usually a numerical representation in a hyperdimensional space. And the specifics and um, the importance and the, the big, actually, advancement that was introduced with the use of deep neural network models is that they managed to transform data from whatever source into an numerical representation in such a way that a certain notion of semantic similarity is preserved within those representations, within those spaces, so to say. We also heard a lot about those feature spaces, embedding spaces, latent space, however you want to call them. Um, the interesting thing is that by using those models, you would build up, so to say, a word space or an or a image space, right? But those spaces were not comparable with each other, so to say, mathematically. You could not take an embedding from a word embedding and an image and get them in a meaningful relation uh, until uh, the emergence of the aforementioned clip model which kind of made it possible to really join all this representation in, a, in, a, in one space where the semantic similarity between data items of different modalities is preserved. Of course, in the context of deep learning there were, and machine learning, there were many attempts, and it is a research field in itself to do that for years, for decades, right? And, uh, People were trying to find, so to say, a smart way, a formula of transformation. And this problem got solved, uh, as many other problems in deep learning, following the same pattern, actually, of using large amount of data, right? So we don't find, so to say, an engineered or a smart way of transforming it, but we find ways of leveraging large amounts of data, and that is exactly why CLIP was so revolutionary, not to say that there is not 
a smart setup behind the whole network, but it only works because it really works on 400 billion image text pairs. Um, so CLIP was kind of the revolutionary moment in multimodal deep learning because it was the first model that made it possible to uh, analyze images and text in a joint uh, feature space uh, that preserves a semantic similarity on a level that was not possible before. And with the emergence of CLIP, it kind of this whole boom in, in the multimodal deep learning started. Many variations of that model emerged, like this open CLIP version that works on an open version of the data set, sound CLIP, like in integrating different modalities. It also became the guiding principle of all those text to image models. And it is also integrated in many retrieval systems that function on the way of kind of exploring image collection using text descriptions. My f one of the first encounters in my own research with CLIP was on the task of generating uh, iconographic image captions, which was kind of an interesting task maybe two years ago because it was quite challenging to uh, be able to automate or build a model that can describe artworks not in this very dull, object-oriented, computer vision type of language where you'll usually have a very finite set of objects with which you operate, right? Like uh, person, car, bicycle, and things like that. But to be able to kind of build a more contextually uh, valuable description. Uh, but however, by, by trying to build such a model, one of the first issues was really how do you evaluate if a caption is meaningful or, or not in relation to that artwork. And uh, here I use the so-called CLIP score, which is basically uh, a variation of the similarity between images and text in the CLIP space. And by kind of analyzing my outputs of my model, I realized that CLIP is more aware, so to say, of the contextual knowledge, that you will get a higher score for a description, Eve offers the fruit to Adam, than, you know, the usual the man and a woman standing by the tree. So this was kind of an indicator that there is more to it in CLIP than just the models that we used before, that it somehow integrates contextual knowledge. But it also brings us to this very fundamental question of, of what is really similarity? What is the, the notion of similarity that is encoded uh, within CLIP? And because CLIP is trained on such a, such a large, quite unknown and, and quite messy data set, all the possible relations between images and texts that exist right, in a subset of the internet uh, are, are just kind of integrated under the term similarity. But we know that the image and text relations can actually be quite different. And just the fact that an image appears next, next to a text doesn't necessarily mean it's similar, right? And I think it also, the emergence of these models kind of brings us back to the really fundamental questions of how do you translate an image into text or, or text into an image? What does it mean? You know, what, 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 what do we want to see? What are all the possible relations in, in, in that context? And all those text to image models that emerged in the last year or so, starting from the kind of clip-based uh, implementations of uh, GAN-based implementations of clip-guided space to diffusion models. Well, they, they're all, in one way or another, inspired or guided by the mechanisms that are encoded in clip, right? But we're not really, it is very difficult to understand for each of these models what is the exact contribution of clip or somehow. But uh, my understanding of, of those text-to-image models was somehow that they give you a window into that hyper-dimensional abstract joint space of images and text that encodes the whole internet. And those models give us an opportunity to explore that space. And 
to go in a kind of different direction from prompt engineering or trying to find the most interesting or beautiful looking images, I wanted to kind of try to see really how simple translations work, right? So if I put a prompt that is just the cat, right? What I expect to get is, is images of cats. And this is what I get. More or less cute cats, but in the end they're cats. However, if I, if I put the prompt the seal, I get a more interesting result because the seal is a polysemic word in the English language. So you get an animal and you get a, this vex device, you the emblem, you get something in between, you get a weird combination of that, right? And, and uh, it kind of also gives you the visual interpretation of, of polysemic appearances in words, right? Um, if, I, if I go beyond that and say, well, the seventh cat, I still get a cat and it's quite, I think it's more interesting looking, has some kind of melancholy to it, more illustrations. But if I go to the seventh seal, I get something completely different, right? I get an output that I cannot understand if I've never heard about the Bergman's film, Seventh Seal, right? So the fact that there was a film that kind of became well-known and iconic and that it had this title related to it remains, so to say, forever embedded in that space. It has a certain strength and the specific motives and the visual properties and language of that film end up, con concretely this is the stable diffusion model that I used for this experiment. So an interesting other thing is that basically it overrides some existing references because if I prompt the opening of the seventh seal, I don't get seven angels or seven trumpets or a lamb or anything anything related to the, to the description of the opening of the seventh seal in the book of Revelation. Oh, I again get some scenes from, let's say something that resembles Bergman's film. So one could also say that interestingly, a cultural reference that has a century long meaning is now overwritten by the, this specific iconic relation that is encoded in that space. Um, and this is just one illustration of, of numerous other examples of different concepts that are kind of integrated in that space. And um, in the context of, of what has been happening in the last two years, let's say, in, in particularly in this research area that is dedicated to multimodal models, I see a lot of effort focused on um, improving image quality. So it also all started with, we want to have more realistic or convincing looking images or aesthetically pleasing images. And so a lot of effort is, is kind of directed into that research area also uh, in, in expanding the modalities to 3D or uh, video and things like that. But I also see that there is uh, an, another kind of stream of new research questions opening up. They're not so much concerned about, well, is this generated image nice or whatever, but what is really encoded in there? Um, how, how it is encoded? What, uh, how people interact with those models? What, what do they prompt? Uh, also, how fundamentally this whole uh, vast amount of generated images will influence our perception of, of the image or of, of media content in general and our trustworthiness in, image, in, in media content. So I see that there, is, there are many, many levels of, of research uh, possibilities that are opening up with those models. And so one of the ideas was kind of to think about them as some kind of cultural snapshots. Um, an interesting thing that was already previously discussed is that the clip model was trained, so to say, on a snapshot of the internet that was taken in 2020. So you can say it knows the world up until that point. And a lot of things happened since that are not integrated in that world which is encoded in that model. So it, it, 
one way we could look at it is some kind of synchronic thing, right? It takes the moment of, of internet at a specific point in time. But at the same time, it also integrates so many historical references, cultural references. So it's kind of diachronic at the same time. So we don't really know how to approach that object, how to understand it, um, how to analyze it. Also, a cultural snapshot um, definition that was given by Weisbuch, Max Weisbuch in his paper, Cultural Snapshot Theories and Methods, say that cultural snapshots are recorded sam samples of public environments commonly encountered by many people. And um, it seems to me that these models are somehow um, really integrating recorded samples of, of public environments, right, in one way, in a specific technological framework. But at the same time, they m might, as such, serve as, as objects that might be interesting for empirical cultural studies and for detecting cultural patterns, because um, in his paper, Weisbuch says that cultural patterns are things that we can study only if they're reoccurring, like reoccurring relations. So one instance of something is not a pattern, it has to reoccur in order to be a pattern. And he mentions the example of contemporary American institutions and maybe also other institutions around the world that include men more frequently than women in leadership positions. So this is something that is like a pattern in order, if we encounter it at one institution, it's not enough to be somehow evidence of a pattern. It has to happen more often, right? And the interesting thing is that, of course, we can use different other data sources to, so to say, provide evidence for a cultural pattern. But also, these models, when we, when we kind of interact with them, show exactly those kind of patterns. And people did analysis on that and show that there is gender bias if you, I don't know, prompt a cashier, get a female, and things like that. So the, it, it actually, the fact that something is a pattern and is reoccurring, you can say that it happens if it's integrated in an image-text relation and it's occurring more often in the data set, it, the, the, the similarity, so to say, strengthens. And therefore, this pattern comes out. And we, we talked about, it was mentioned, this comparison with the, with the collective unconscious, which I think is very interesting and it's reoccurring. It came to me, it came to many other people because really those models are kind of um, an encapsulation of so many associations that exist, right? So we can really look at them as some kind of little version of, the co of a very culturally specific collective unconscious. But the question that emerges is how do we deal with the shadow work? How do we deal with all the things that are there that we don't like, with the dark side of it, right? The, the biases, the violent content, and stuff like that. And here I see two very different and interesting approaches in, one of, in two of the main models that are used in, in, in these things today. One is, as you probably all know, stable diffusion, and they had a very libertarian approach, right? They made, they were the ones to kind of make an Oprah version of the data set. They made the, the model publicly available without restriction and the thing they kind of gave was a warning that this is a general text-to-image diffusion model and mirrors biases and misconceptions. Uh, on the other side, Dali had a kind of a very different approach and open AI. They were very restricted. They never made the data set open. They also had like this restricted access with waiting lists and stuff like that. But one more interesting thing is that they implemented pre-training mitigations to be kind of safe, right? To, to remove the risk of using these models, to remove violent and sexual content. Then they also had to remove um, biases, which actually became worse when they removed violent and sexual content. Uh, but one more interesting 
aspect which they did is they implemented ways of avoiding memorization, something they called image regurgitation, right? The fact that this model, when you prompt something, that it spits out a well-known image. And in this aspect, I find very, very interesting because what it means to avoid memorization is actually means resolving existing cultural references. So we have come to a situation where we have, for instance, same prompt that you use in DALI and stable diffusion gives you quite different results. For instance, Starry Night, which is a well-known title in the Western art canon. We kind of all know how this painting looks like, and if we use stable diffusion, we get Starry Night, right? Also, I mean, there has to be a rainbow on the dark side of moon, if you, if, if, if you ho I know, hope you know what I mean, and things like that. Or the cure is a very specific looking group of people in stable diffusion. However, in Dali, you get more literal translations, right? You get, Dali doesn't know how Carl Gustav Jung look like, looks like, right? So also a magical mystery tour is something, uh, some Scottish, <laughs> Uh, landscape rather than the Beatles album. So these are things where you see that there is some kind of relation between one model being to a certain extent culturally agnostic and another one being more specific. And now the question of course emerges which one do we want, which one do we find more interesting and if we think about all the, all the biases that are integrated um, and the, the fact that those tools will be integrated in various different frameworks for content creation, what kind of models do we want? Because it, in, to a certain extent, those models that preserve cultural specificity are maybe more interesting for research. At the same time, you know, they're maybe um, a bit more risky to integrate somewhere else. But another thing that I find also quite interesting when we talk about the, the source of this cultural dependency is that in stable diffusion, it's quite clear that it's on the data set, whatever that means, right? The data, the internet scrapped data set. But in, in DALI, it's, it shifts. It's not necessarily culturally agnostic because the cultural dependency shifts on the choices of the developers that are working on those models. What they consider to be ethical or relevant is also dependent on their own cultural understanding in one point in time. So it's never a neutral position when we work with biases, right? It can be, so it's just a question where will the, 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 the focus of the decision and the dependency, where, where will it be? So an interesting example is um, prompt songs of faith and devotion. Unfortunately, nothing similar to the Depeche Mode album, no purple <laughs> and black in Stable Diffusion. However, I did this on many other analysis with much more, many more images, and I always noticed that there is something we can say a Western-centric bias, that the Christian iconography is kind of more associated with the words faith and devotion, so, which corresponds to things that we already know about stable diffusion, which is much more relying on clip. Um, but if we, if we do the same thing in um, DALI, I would say we get a, a, a somehow Eastern-centric bias. So we get a complete opposite. And it seems to me that uh, people at DALI were kind of aware of the Western-centric bias and trying to eliminate that one, you end up basically on the polar opposite of the same bias. And which, which brings us to the really important question is not to develop culturally agnostic or specific, but really inclusive models. And how do we do that? You know, that is, I think, a very big and, and um, complex research challenge. Another thing that I would like to kind of conclude is that the things that I've been kind of exploring and also the things that we've seen in previous presentations are basically based on our interactions with those systems and kind of if we stumble upon something interesting kind of by chance, right? So there are no really 
systematic or I would say automatic approaches of studying these things, of biases and different concepts within those models. And I think that is a very um, new and exciting research field. But however, there is a very interesting shift happening and the Afor also mentioned uh, ways of kind of interacting with every model that emerged in the last year, every text to image generator, a few days later there, there would be a, a website of so-called artist studies where a group of people would just assemble lists of names to test if the model knows or does not know that artist, right? So, um, of course, it's, it's a very interesting topic in itself, the question of who and who is not in the latent canon. But another thing that I find very interesting is that the way that we deal with those models is shifting because um, previously, so to say, specifically in the context of the digital humanities, you had a quite linear approach. You have a model, you have a data set that you use to train the model, and then you apply it on another data set to solve a problem. But now, we basically, so to say, by hand, assemble lists and synthetic data sets to study the model. We don't, it's not a tool anymore. We're not just using it. We want to know what is in there. Of course, what we actually want to know is what is in the whole large data set that we cannot analyze, what is encapsulated in that model. But I think it's a very nice shift uh, in the way that people approach them because, um, the, the focus is really not so much on these models as tools, but on these models as objects. And we use currently uh, very non, not computational approaches, so to say, to study them. We build up lists of names, so to say, or we, we do it by hand, or even this clip interrogator, if, if you know what I'm talking about, some of you, which is kind of built to do the opposite is dependent on a finite list of concepts, so we can never really tell you everything. It's also somehow a more automated process, but still, uh, I find this is a very interesting shift. And to get back to um, uh, something that was already mentioned, and yesterday and today, is of course the concept of the mirror, right? They give us a mirror image, but at the same time they magnify something, that we, and at the same time, it's, it's all very noisy. We're not really sure what is the contribution of each part of those con uh, complex pipelines. You know, how much of clip is in DALI and how much is it in here and what if I use this? And, and also it kind of gives you a kaleidoscopic image if you want. So we're dealing with an object that resembles these three and maybe many other things and we don't really know, you know, what are we looking at and how should we use it? And I think that is um, a beginning of an interesting research journey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eva, for this very enlightening snapshot of your research work. <coughs> Does anyone have any questions for Eva? Now it's your chance right here. Yeah, thank you. That was really um, inspiring and very, uh, oh, sorry. Um, uh, very interesting. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I'm still thinking about um, the, one of the last slides that you showed where you said that you use non-computational approaches to kind of try and interpret the output of the model or like how the model functions, but the ultimate goal is to understand what's in the data set, right? Um, and I think that that is a very uh, kind of also like almost political uh, um, stance, to, so to speak. Um, and I think like my question is, when we, when we look at papers like Abeba Behana's um, analyzation of the Lyon data set where she and colleagues showed that there's so much pornography and racism and, and everything in that data set. Um, and then we have all those miti mitigations that you also mentioned that the um, model kind of obscures those areas of the data set. Um, how would you like, 
it's, it's a bit hard to, to formulate my question, I'm realizing now. Um, so if, if we now use approaches that are more like a f visual analysis of the output, but we know that the, the, the output is already kind of cut off, right? Uh, do you see a way how we can get into like a, a more critical um, look at the data sets through that way, or is it already kind of fenced in because we only get a certain output from the models because they have some limitations in what they want to show you? Like, how do we deal, that, deal with that? Do we need more regulations as to you have to publish the data set, or like, how do we deal with that problem? Because we know it's there, it's a huge problem, but we would never see it and would never be able to analyze it by just going the visual analysis way, right? Right, I think uh, for regulations it's, it's uh, a bit too late, <laughs> <laughs> I would say, because uh, since the stable diffusion model was published quite openly and without any restrictions, it opened you know, the possibility for using it in various domains that we may not agree on. So for that is, of course, with all these things that are happening in the field of deep learning, a very uh, interesting question because when we come to a point of really understanding what's going on, it's been a year or two and things are there and all the regulations that people end up having are it's just, you know, it's, it takes such a long time <laughs> to, because also that is, I think, the challenge of the interdisciplinary works, you know, that we have to communicate those concepts and try to understand, okay, what is this latent space? How is this functioning? How is this integrated? And even for people, of course, working in the field, it's very difficult because of the black box and because the field is advancing at enormous speed. So it's, it's uh, I think, also a challenge for engineers to keep up with what is happening because it's, it's, it's really happening very fast. And then to react. <laughs> so you know, it, it, the interesting part, I think, also, of what everything that happened, happened like in in a year and a half since, since CLIMP emerged. And uh, it was very challenging also for me to kind of keep up with that research field. Now we come to the point of communicating because we see it's not just in deep learning, it's a question that is much broader and we need people, specialists from different fields to give their inputs. But while we go through this process, it's, I don't know, it becomes very, even more complex, you know, to ask those questions because many more voices give many more inputs, right? How do we deal with bias? I mean, some things we can agree on that we all can say, yes, we want that or we don't want that. But there are some things that are maybe not so clear, maybe more in a gray area, and here it becomes more complex, really, how to understand and, and deal with that. There's another question on the left side, and after that, I see. Fabian, okay. Hello, uh, thanks for the talk, it was really great. Um, I, I see another problem, when Stability AI um, open source their code, and also the Stable Diffusion model, they also open source the means to fine tune this model and train it on new data, fine tune it on new data. And now we have Waifu Diffusion, which is a model specialized in generating uh, big breasted women with childish facial features. And there will be more such fine tuned models. So I see the problem is not so much the specific Lion 5P, which is a very general, but focused on the Global North generated content data set, but also that, that, that web scraping is also a tool that everyone can use, and then people are going to make problematic models, not only problematic, like the, the stable diffusion model will probably be the least problematic model in the future. And I wonder if there is some kind of or if you, could th if you can think about an approach, how to tackle the, the problem with problematic models, like how to analyze the model itself or how to um, expose um, which model was used or something like that to, to start like, tackling this particular problem. 
like there will be probably time, like there will be probably a stable diffusion model um, fine tuned on child porn, and then this model will be um, kind of uh, spread in the public, and then people can generate their own content. Yeah, yeah, so I, that's I understand. <laughs> what you mean. Yeah, that is the new trend is basically to kind of this text inversion and fine tuning to kind of develop specific little worlds, right? These are kind of general foundation models that are encapsulating everything, so to say, not everything, but uh, and now the trend is kind of everybody builds their own little flavor of these things, and um, uh, of course. It, it, we come back to the question uh, that was raised yesterday with all the technology, good and bad things, right? So at the same time, it's the fact that people are using it for fine-tuning it on what you mentioned. It's, it's just, again, you know, the mirror image of our society. The, the root cause is somewhere else. It's not in that model. It's, it's in us somehow. That, things get used in that way. But I also see the discussion about what you mentioned, uh, having child porn photography synthesized data sets. I, I can imagine people saying, well, yeah, at least, you know, they're not using real images. So it's, I, I already imagine, you know, many different voices coming to, to really, to the discussion where we can like, what is happening? Why are we even discussing this, you know? so. Of course, uh, many potential risks, and I'm not really, I'm not really aware of uh, of a solution. But I think it's very important to uh, communicate the, the concepts and the underlying principles to uh, to a broader audience, because people need to understand more clearly what is there and how it functions, and it's not just an AI research field specific product that's much broader and I think um, events like this are a good opportunity to really communicate those underlying principles. Yeah, I agree. Fabian, what about you wanted to say something? Thanks. Um, thanks, Eva, that was really great. Um, you partially answered my question, but I'm going to ask it anyway again because you spoke very diplomatically. I, I want to ask you about the question of critique and the entanglement of um, let's say application and model analysis, right? You, I couldn't agree more that whenever you use these systems, then you know there, there's something that you learn about these systems, and um, sometimes the emphasis can be on critiquing the model, and sometimes it's on the application. So I, I want to ask you, like, wh whose job is this? Like, <laughs> obviously yours, right? Because you're doing this work. But I'm thinking in terms of academic communities, for instance, right? Where do you see this work happening? Right, so is it, do we need to train the engineers in cultural critique? Do we need to, you know, does Google need more ethicists, which is the industry's solution? So what kind of communities can you see that can solve these problems or that might even need to emerge still to, to tackle this, if you, if you want to talk about this a little bit? Uh, yes. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think maybe this, uh, this field of digital humanities that nobody really knows what it's about and it's around for a few years could be a very fruitful place to start because it's really now becoming more obvious that we don't, that, that those models are not tools and that what we consider digital humanities is not just using some tools and performing the same kind of methodological analysis that we usually do, but with digital items, but that it really includes thinking in, in terms of different types of methodologies and different concepts. And I would say maybe that is a very, that there is a lot of material for, for, for that particular field. You know, for people in between and like you and me somehow, and, and our role is to try to build this community and discuss like this concepts try to get more people engaged. I, I find it an interesting phenomenon, that's why I'm engaged with it. Uh, who should be doing it? The people that find it interesting. So, but, but another thing that I think is also uh, on the line of that, somebody mentioned um, this uh, Twitter uh, post about uh, the concept of the kiss 
uh, Eric, I don't, I don't remember the surname. Um, and then later, a few weeks later, he said he was, the, the concept was about how if you say a couple is kissing, you only get like straight couples kissing, right? But now, like a few weeks later, you don't get just straight couples, you get also gay couples kissing, right? So you can say that somebody is following <laughs> these things, but also that those inputs are kind of partially implemented, that there is no systematic way, and that we don't really follow what is happening. So, okay, that's a trend on Twitter, we don't want that in the data set, let's implement it. And this can happen with different kind of things, right? So, yeah. Thank you, Eva. Considering the time, uh, I'd like to ask you to take all further questions to the lunch break, and uh, I'd like to continue in the program. Thank you very much. Next up is, well, as of, yeah. You can clap, sure. 